Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I will start with the usual daily update on COVID-19. An additional 17 positive cases were confirmed yesterday, which takes the total now in Scotland of confirmed cases to 18,213. Um, it's possibly worth uh, noting that the percentage of people uh, tested uh, who turn out to be positive uh, is now well below 1% on a daily basis. Yesterday it was 0.3%, uh, which is one of uh, many signs of the progress we are making. A total of 823 patients are currently in hospital with the virus, either confirmed or suspected, and that is three fewer than yesterday, but it includes a reduction of five in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 17 people uh, last night were in intensive care, and that is one fewer than yesterday. And since 5th March, a total of 4,042 patients who had tested positive and needed hospital treatment have now been able to leave hospital, and I'm sure we wish all of them well. And in the past 24 hours, I am uh, very, very pleased to say that no deaths were registered of a patient confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. Now, it's worth noting that when I've announced a zero figure for deaths in the past couple of weeks, it's reflected deaths registered at the weekend, and we know that those can be artificially low. Today is the first time that figure has been zero on a weekday since the 20th of March, which is before lockdown began. Uh, that is really significant, and it is down to the sacrifices of each and every one of you. Uh, so thank you to all of you. And of course, it means that the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement of people confirmed by a test as having the virus remains at 2,482. Now, the loss of life is still devastating, of course, and I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone behind these statistics who has lost a loved one as a result of this illness, as I hope we continue to report uh, lower uh, numbers of deaths we should never, ever become inured to the human suffering behind these figures. So again, uh, my thoughts are with everybody who has suffered bereavement. I also want to express my thanks, uh, as I always do, to our health and care workers and indeed to all key workers uh, across the country. I'm going to make a, a special uh, mention today, uh, given an issue that I'll come back to later on, to our refuse collectors who right throughout uh, this crisis have been working to help uh, keep our country uh, clean and tidy. But key workers, the length and breadth of the country, are doing extraordinary work, and you have my and the Scottish Government's very grateful thanks. Now, there's one <coughs> issue I want to focus on today, and it concerns a very significant change which comes into effect next week from Monday. All retail premises that have outdoor entrances and exits will be able to reopen. Uh, that change doesn't apply to indoor shopping centres yet. Uh, they'll have to wait a bit longer, but it does cover the vast majority of shops. Many stores have, of course, been planning for this moment for some time. At the start of phase one in late May, we published guidance to help retailers prepare for a safe reopening. This morning, I visited uh, the New Look store at Fort Kinnaird in Edinburgh, and I saw for myself the kinds of measures that shops are putting in place. Amongst other things, those measures include new limits on the number of customers that are allowed in store at any one time, new processes for cleaning items and quarantining items that have been handled, and new signs to help with physical distancing. Alongside these in-store preparations, retailers and local authorities have been making changes to the public spaces outside shops. For example, distance markers have been laid down and street furniture is being removed to allow for safe outdoor queuing. All of that has required an enormous amount of work, so I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who is helping our retail sector get back up and running. At the same time, I also want to thank the key workers in shops and pharmacies who have kept the country going over the past three months because they have been working in what we have called essential shops. All of your efforts are hugely appreciated as well. Scotland's retailers are making the necessary preparations, but I want to stress that all of us, each and every single one of us, have a role to play in making sure that this reopening can work and work safely. That's why today the Scottish Government is publishing new guidance for customers, and that sets out the basic rules that all of us need to follow in order to keep safe ourselves and to help keep others safe too. As the guidance says, there are some people who should not be going into shops at all uh, for now. For example, those who have COVID-19 symptoms and are self-isolating, and of course those who are in the shielding group. 
If you're in either of these groups or if you need extra support, then you can have food and medicine delivered to you. Uh, that might be by family and friends, uh, local volunteers or supermarket delivery services. But if you need help over and above that, you can call the National Helpline. The number is 0800 111 4000 uh, and help, including the delivery of essential food and medicines, can be arranged. For those of us who are able to go to the shops from Monday, the guidance is clear. You should shop locally if you can. Uh, for now, use the five mile limit as a guide and don't travel further unless it's absolutely necessary. I appreciate that for people living in rural and island communities, it might not be possible to stick to that kind of limit. But for most of us, it should be. And it is perhaps an opportunity to support our local shops in the process as well. Uh, you should try to shop on your own or in as small a group as possible and avoid going to crowded shops at peak times. Choose a time when the shops are likely to be less busy. When you do go into a shop, please wear a face covering. That's something that we are advising you strongly to do. I wore a face covering this morning when I visited New Look, so I know that it takes a bit of getting used to, but you do get used to it. And the hard fact is uh, that a bit of discomfort, which none of us enjoy, uh, is preferable to getting COVID or indeed to passing it on to someone else. Face coverings serve a really important purpose in enclosed spaces like shops. By wearing one, you reduce the risk that you will unknowingly pass the virus on to other people and other people wearing a face covering are helping to protect you. So please, unless medical reasons prevent it, wear a face covering if you're going into a shop. In addition, you should only visit stores which have infection control measures in place. You should use the hand sanitizer they provide. And at New Look this morning, there was plenty of hand sanitizer stations around. Uh, but take your own as well, in case uh, you can't find uh, any that is available. And finally, uh, when we are out shopping, all of us need to remain patient and polite. Uh, there are going to be times when retail staff ask us to follow rules which we're not used to because they haven't previously been in place. So it's important for all of us to listen to them and to treat staff and indeed our fellow customers with respect. These rules are there for the protection of all of us. Uh, abusing retail staff because they're telling you to do something you don't want to do is not acceptable. Uh, these people are at work and have to be kept safe too. So please treat them uh, with respect and courtesy. The guidance we're publishing today is very straightforward. It's also extremely important. So please take a look at it. As with all our guidance, you'll find it on the Scottish Government website. Um, and by following the guidance, we can help support our retail sector. Uh, this crisis has been and continues to be tough for our economy overall. But within that, the retail sector has been hard hit. So I want to see people support our shops in communities the length and breadth of the country. But make sure we do it safely and responsibly so that uh, this important step out of lockdown can be taken while we continue to suppress the virus. And that really is my concluding point, uh, suppressing the virus, driving it as far as we can towards total elimination has to be our overriding priority. Uh, we've made exceptional progress over the past three months uh, and the figures today highlight that, but it has only been possible because the vast majority of us have stuck to the rules. Uh, you'll keep uh, hearing me say this time and time again because it's true and it is important that we never forget it. The virus has not gone away and it will not go away of its own accord. Uh, there are plenty parts of the world right now where it is still on the rise and there are some parts of the world where, unfortunately, it appears to be on the rise again as societies and economies open up. The warning signs are all around us and we mustn't ignore them. We ignore them at our peril. A big concern for me is that as we ease more restrictions, people drop their guard. It is perhaps human nature. And of course, the potential for that increases as people are out and about and seeing each other much more. Uh, we saw an example of that last night in Kelvin Grove Park in Glasgow. Uh, and while I understand, and I, I really, really do, uh, I understand people's desire to enjoy the sunshine on the very few days a year when we actually have any, uh, please avoid crowded places. If you find that the place you want to visit is busy, don't go there. Try to find somewhere quieter or go back at a time when it is going to be quiet. Crowded places are a big risk 
And that is true of outdoor crowded places, although the risk might be slightly lower than it is uh, of indoor places. Crowded places generally please seek to avoid. When large crowds gather, it gives opportunities for the virus to spread. And this highly infectious virus, which we know can be deadly, and increasingly we know that it can also do long-term health damage, this virus will take those opportunities if we give them to it. So we mustn't provide them. Uh, and of course, if you are out and about enjoying public spaces responsibly, and this is the point that I alluded to at the outset, please take your litter home with you. Refuse collectors across the country are doing an incredible job, and I do want to thank them today, but they simply should not be having to clean up after outdoor gatherings. Uh, so please, now more than ever, our individual decisions affect all of us. Uh, they affect society as a whole. That means all of us need to be considerate of one another. That should be the case at all times, but it is particularly true right now. It's really important that we care for each other, that we look out for each other, that we remember that the things we do could harm other people. And if we all act in that spirit of collective love and solidarity as we have throughout this, then we will continue to see that progress continue. So before I hand over to the Economy Secretary, I just want to remind everybody uh, what that key public health guidance says. At the moment, you should still only meet up with other households outdoors. Uh, so if you think it might rain, plan for that. Don't go indoors just because it's raining. Only meet up with up to two other households at any one time right now. Uh, the restrictions on larger gatherings. And it's worth stressing uh, that that includes mass gatherings such as demonstrations. These restrictions right now remain enforceable by law. If you're visiting people, you should only be going indoors to use the toilet or get through to a garden and remember to clean any surfaces that you touch uh, as you do so. Uh, I will end with facts, uh, as I have done uh, repeatedly in the last few days, which is the public health campaign summarising the key points you need to remember. Face coverings in enclosed spaces like public transport and shops. Avoid crowded places. Clean your hands and hard surfaces regularly. Two metre distancing, that remains the rule. And lastly, self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. If we all remember and abide by these five basic measures, then all of us can stay safe, protect others and save lives. Uh, we have made so much progress, but it will reverse in a heartbeat if we drop our guard. And it would be heartbreaking for so many reasons for us now to go backwards. So please, let's all unite to keep this virus under control. And thank you to all of you for what you have been doing and what I know you will continue to do to help us achieve that. I'll hand over now to Fiona Hislop, the Economy Secretary, and then uh, Jason Leach is going to conclude with a few words before questions. As the First Minister has said, we are now starting to see the gradual reopening of our economy. Uh, to that end, I want again to touch on the report that was published earlier this week by Benny Higgins and the Advisory Group on Economic Recovery. The report highlights the fact that Scotland, as with other countries, faces enormous challenges and we need to all work together as never before to ensure our country emerges through this pandemic with a green economic recovery that has inclusion and well-being at its heart. We wanted the report to be ambitious and far-reaching and with their strong and comprehensive set of recommendations, this certainly has been achieved. The report identifies the importance of employment, education and equality. And I agree that each one of these will be vital as we seek to create a society that is resilient, fair and one in which everyone has the opportunity to be successful. I thank them again for their work and we will now develop a detailed response to the report which will be published before the end of July. The report also highlights the importance of cross-sectoral and public-private sector alliances, and I know that Scottish civil society will rise to the challenge. We are aware that our economic recovery has to be education-led, and we know that our universities have much to contribute. So too does our powerful college sector, and I see colleges as an important contributor to our collective and national response with their connections to business and communities. They will be able to swiftly and flexibly upskill and reskill people to take on the economic and employment challenges we now face. We know we will need to quickly adapt our labour market for an economy that requires a workforce with a digital, low carbon, renewable, financial and health and care focus. 
Colleges can play a significant role that will enable us to deliver on this requirement and avoid or minimise time spent by anyone, particularly our young people, in unemployment. We will continue to see more and more of our economy opening up over the next few weeks. And I want to take a moment to outline some of the key changes that we will see. Non-essential retail, as we've heard, can open from the 29th of June, providing what I'm sure will be a welcome opportunity for many of us to support local businesses that have been closed by shopping locally. The Scottish Government is supporting this by running a Shop Local Safely campaign in newspapers across Scotland. Workplaces in the manufacturing sector, which have been closed until now, also open on the 29th of June, which will be another significant step as we move to restart the Scottish economy. On the 3rd of July, it is intended to lift the guidance advising people in Scotland to travel no more than five miles for leisure and recreation purposes. And although the tourism sector will not open fully until the 15th of July, we intend that self-contained holiday accommodation, for example, holiday cottages and lodges or caravans where there are no shared services can open from the 3rd of July and outdoor hospitality, such as beer gardens, will be permitted to reopen on the 6th of July. All of this represents a positive step forward for Scotland's economy, but these changes depend entirely on the continued suppression of the virus. If at any stage there appears to be a risk of its resurgence, our path out of lockdown will be halted and we may even have to go backwards. We all must continue to work together to ensure the safe and sustainable reopening of Scotland's economy. Thank you. And, uh, lastly, I'll hand over to Jason to say a few words. Thank you, Minister. I, I wanted to take the opportunity today to speak briefly about the Scottish Blood Transfusion Service and to thank them for the life-saving work that they do every day and they have continued during these few months. The organisation and the workers within it, managers, nurses, doctors, and many, many others, have worked extremely hard during the pandemic to make sure that NHS Scotland has enough blood to meet the transfusion needs of patients. I'd like to give a huge thank you as well to those of you who donate, the blood and platelet donors who have provided an amazing response since the restrictions began. And as we start to take very tentative steps into phase two and three, it's really important that we keep donating. Perhaps you don't realize that we cannot store blood for a long time. We need a continuous supply and we need to keep Scotland's blood and platelet stocks at their target levels. During the pandemic, the usual donor eligibility still apply, but we have had to add some new criteria. So please do not donate if you're over 70, you have COVID, you are in self-isolation with symptoms of COVID, or you're in self-isolation because a household member has symptoms of COVID. Or if you've shown symptoms of COVID-19 or tested positive for COVID-19, you must not donate until at least 28 days following the end of your final symptom. To protect both donors and staff, practical arrangements for blood donations during the pandemic have changed, which include the introduction of clearly physical distancing measures on sessions and bookings. Sessions are now run by appointment only, so please visit scottblood.co.uk or call 0345 90 90 treble 9 to arrange an appointment and find out more about the new arrangements in place. And thank you once again for those of you who have donated over this period. Uh, many thanks, Jason. I'll move straight to questions now. The first question today is from Katrina Renton from BBC Scotland. Thank you, First Minister. Um, we saw, as you mentioned, the scenes at Kelvin Grove Park yesterday evening. We saw the scenes in the Meadows in Edinburgh at Portobello. How do you get back control of the situation? Are people still keeping to the messages or are they forgetting them? Do the police have to play a bigger role for you to get keep that control over the next couple of months? Well, I think the police are doing a great job and I think they, uh, you know, very uh, sensitively, quickly and, and of course peacefully uh, dealt with uh, what might have been a, a difficult situ situation in Kelvin Grove Park last night and my, my thanks go to them. Look, I, I don't want to stand here and lecture people. The vast majority of people have complied with all of these rules and continue to comply with all of these rules and I can, I'll never be able to uh, properly convey the depth of my gratitude to people the length and breadth of the country for that. And we see the, the benefits of that in the, the numbers I've reported to you today. And I do believe that even those who have 
perhaps breached the rules have not done so deliberately. I understand, uh, particularly for young people, on a day like yesterday, the hottest day of the year, if you're a young person, a student, you're living in a flat, you want to get out and about. You want to enjoy the sunshine and get some fresh air. I, you know, many years ago now, I was a student at Glasgow University. I you know, know how uh, lovely it is to sit in, in Kelvin Grove Park on a nice day. So I understand that, and I don't think anybody or very many people are taking action deliberately because they want to cause harm. But it's really important that we all understand the risks that that kind of gathering uh, presents right now. We know that big gatherings give opportunities for the virus to spread, and we know that's true outdoors as well as indoors. The risk might be slightly lower outdoors, but it is not non-existent. And so all I want to continue to do is, is ask people to do the right thing it means sacrifice. It has meant sacrifice every day of this crisis. And I'm asking for more. I understand that. But I don't want to be standing here. And I know none of you want to be listening to me standing here over the weeks to come saying that these numbers have started to go in the wrong direction again. And I know how easy it would be to send this progress into reverse. And, and once a virus like this takes hold again, it can spread exponentially very quickly. And suddenly, we're looking at rising numbers of deaths again, rising numbers of cases, and we're looking at the prospect of our NHS being overwhelmed. So we, we absolutely can't let our guard down. Uh, there is a tendency, and I think we all uh, you know, are susceptible to this. We, we look at the numbers. I quoted a number today, 0.3% of people tested just so they were positive. So there's a tendency to think this virus has gone away. Viruses don't just go away. We suppress them. And when we stop taking the action that has suppressed them, they'll start to spread again. So we need to continue to do the things that we know keep it under control. So please, please keep doing this because it's still out there, but we can keep it under control if we continue to do all the right things. Uh, Stephen Brown from STV. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, Economy Secretary, there you have laid out again some of the dates for when various businesses will reopen over the coming uh, weeks. But you will be aware there are a number of businesses um, driving instructors, beauticians, gyms, for example, who are still not yet being given a date, and some of them to, that they feel forgotten about. So what um, financial support are you going to give them over the weeks and months ahead? Because some of them may be a long way yet from opening up. Um, and to Professor Leach as well, part of the reason why some of them are not opening up is the, the risk of, of the spread of the infection, and particularly any second wave. You'll be aware there's a kind of not necessarily a split opinion, but there's differences within the scientific community about how likely a second wave could be. How likely do you fear that could potentially be? Uh, I'll hand over to the Economy Secretary first. Well, clearly we've set out a route map with dates for a great deal of the economy, but those that uh, involve personal services and close contact will obviously need to have the proper health advice in order to reopen and reopen safely and with their customers' confidence in doing so. Um, if you are self-employed, the UK self-employed scheme is extended as well to October. That will help support those in that area. The Scottish Government have established a newly self-employed scheme that can help people in that area. If you have a small business, you're able to apply for the grants, and indeed we've opened that up, so that even if you are not the ratepayer yourself, you can also apply for that grant support. And obviously, if you employ staff, the furloughing scheme is also extended to October. So that is the period of support. We recognise the challenges people have, but also I, I am absolutely convinced that in terms of opening up the economy, these are the sectors where we'll, there'll be a latent demand, and when they do reopen, they should uh, open up to a very strong market uh, when that is safe to do so. Jason. I think it's an excellent question, and I, I can't see the future, so I don't know for sure. But there are some things I do know. I know the virus is unchanged, and I know our individual risk, if we meet the virus, is unchanged, and our chance of passing it on to others, if we meet the virus, is unchanged. No, none of that has changed. We are in the same position now as we were when we first discovered this virus. So therefore, I am on the side of caution. I completely support the gradual reopening of the economy for all of the other harms that we've discussed many times here. But I am worried. Uh, genuinely worried. I, I think we should behave as though we have the virus. Uh, that may seem harsh. We know how to stop an immediate second wave of this virus. We have the knowledge to do that. And it's in the facts, 
It's in the physical distancing. It's in the being cautious around your elderly relatives. Th this is not over. There are still thousands of cases across the UK of this virus in the general community. We described it when we reduced from four to three, the alert system, we described it as still in general circulation. We didn't, we didn't say that randomly. We believe it to still be in general circulation. So that second wave is possible still to stop, but it is also possible we may need reverse gears in the route map. And all of the advice we have given the Cabinet and the First Minister says, yes, we can do that column, we can do beer gardens, we can do hairdressers, we can do children's contact sport, but we have to know that we can reverse it if the numbers go in the wrong direction. My final point would be, I think there's a slight nuance in your question in that I am also concerned about a second wave in the winter, which is a different problem. We don't know enough yet about how to stop that, and that's why Sir Harry Burns has been asked, a mentor of mine and Gregor's, has been asked to help us form a group to think very seriously over the next weeks and months about how we stop that when we're all much more indoors, when we have flu overlaid on top of COVID and things get a little more complex in the winter. That's the second wave in the winter we're also very concerned about. This is something, just very briefly for me on this, that Jason and Gregor and others have been helping me and the Cabinet understand. Uh, we, we talk about a second wave and actually different things are, are meant by that. We face the risk of a spike now as we lift lockdown measures. And as Jason said, we can reduce the risk of that if we all behave in the way that we're being advised uh, to behave, taking all these precautionary measures you know, summarised in that facts campaign. So that's the immediate risk we face. But then there is the, what I guess people generally talk about when they talk about a second wave from previous pandemics is what happens in the autumn and winter. And that's why we need to do some serious planning around that. And that is much more difficult to predict. But what I would say, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a clinician. Um, I am advised by lots of very good scientists and, and good clinicians. Uh, but anybody who tries to say right now that there are no risks of this virus uh, resurging uh, I think are, are, are not being uh, sensible. Uh, and I think the sensible thing to do is to prepare for the worst uh, while we continue to hope for the best. And, and that, I think, should be the principle that guides us. Uh, Fraser Knight from Global. First Minister, um, Scottish Care has welcomed the, the reinstating of visits at care homes that you announced yesterday, but they say the quality of life of some residents has really been impacted by the complete lockdown that they've faced over the past few months. Um, I was just wondering what kind of support is there going to be to try and help the, with the mental health of some of these residents? And if there is a second wave, will the Scottish Government be looking at a different way of dealing with this or will they be facing another complete lockdown again? Well, look, on the, I'll, I'll hand over to Jason in a second, actually, but um, on that latter part of the question, we will have to take whatever steps we think are necessary to protect people as best we can in care homes. It's, uh, this is not a criticism of the question, incidentally, but you know, it's not that many weeks ago that these briefings were dominated by, understandably and legitimately, by questions to me and to the Health Secretary and others about why we didn't do more to protect people in care homes. Now, we, we took all the steps we thought was necessary. So, so now that the risk, is, it's, it's an example of where the risk starts to recede. So we all start to think, well, we, we don't have to be as guarded. I know the impact in care homes, both in terms of the infection toll and the death toll, but the impact of what we've had to do to try to deal with that on frail older people has been has been awful and, and continues to be very difficult. That's why the announcement the Health Secretary made yesterday about a gradual reintroduction very carefully of visiting, I think, is so important. And we'll continue to work, as the Health Secretary does on a weekly basis, with Scottish Care about how we continue to support the care home sector and those within it uh, as we recover from what has been an absolutely dreadful period for all of us, but particularly for those in the care home sector. Jason. One of the things I was uh, pr proudest of from a policy perspective in Scotland was we were the first country in the world to remove visiting restrictions in hospitals and care homes and across our whole health and social care system. It, it broke my heart to have to send briefings up to the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister to say we now need to go back, we need to stop that. It is the reverse gear we've just talked about. Visiting is not just a compassionate intervention. Visiting is a medical intervention. It, it clinically helps hospital patients and care residents. We get fewer falls. We get fewer infections generally. We get all kinds of dementia reduction. 
We get frailty reduction by allowing visitors and family to, to see patients and residents. So we were very, very reluctant to stop it. And now we have to very, very carefully bring it back because of this new viral infection. So we're very cautious, but it's very important that we do it and we do it in a safe way. I'm, I'm hugely supportive of it, but I'm also nervous about it, which is why it will be named individuals, it will be single individuals, it will be outdoors first before indoors, but gradually, if the numbers stay down, as we've just described, we will get back to normal. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a question for the Economy Secretary. Um, Horse Cross Arts, which operates Perth Theatre and the Perth Concert Hall, you'll know, will have, is looking at potential 120 job losses. They're still waiting for firm guidance on when they may be potentially allowed to open. But the Chief Executive has told Radio Tay today that without financial support, he can't see there being a future for the arts sector in Scotland. So I was just wondering how you, you would respond to him. Well, there will definitely be a future for the arts sector in Scotland. Uh, I'm determined that that will be the case. But obviously, there's been a lot of pressure uh, on a number of theatres. They had to they voluntarily closed down early as well, but also are likely to be those that will open reopen at a later date. There has already been financial support for many theatres in Scotland. So, for example, uh, Eden uh, the Eden uh, Theatre uh, up in. Uh, uh, Inverness and also uh, Aberdeen Arts and the theatres there have received funding uh, from the Resilience Fund, so it's Eden Court in Inverness and, and the, the theatres in Aberdeen have received funding from what we call the uh, Pivotal Resilience Fund, which recognises important institutions across Scotland, some of them businesses, but some of them other enterprises. And of course, some theatres have received furlough support for job retention. I have met with the Federation of Scottish Theatres. This morning, I had discussions with the Finance Secretary indicating what room to manoeuvre they might be in terms of resourcing what we understand will be a longer term support that we required for the theatre sector, particularly and indeed music venues in Scotland, and not just the, not just the institutions themselves, it's all the, the workforce, the freelancers that go with that. So I can't give you an instant uh, response to the horse cross situation just now, but I am actively working on the case and I am absolutely determined that we will have a flourishing theatre sector and an art sector that will be uh, something that we can all look forward to when we come through this very, very difficult period for them, as well as for all the individuals and families personally affected by COVID. Can I just very briefly um, firmly uh, underline and echo Fiona's comments there? Um, arts and culture, and that includes theatre, but it's much broader than that, is not just really important to our economy and to our international reputation. Uh, a flourishing arts and culture uh, sector is fundamental to the health and well-being of our country. A Scotland without a, a flourishing arts and culture sector is not a Scotland any, would, any of us would want uh, to see. So there is a real commitment here on behalf of the government. I don't underestimate the difficulty of the challenges. There'll be some tough discussions and tough decisions along the way, uh, but the government is full square behind uh, not just our theatre sector, but arts and culture generally, because it is such a fundamentally important part of our country and who we are as a, a country and I think it's important that that message uh, goes out to the sector uh, right now. Uh, Neil Purin from PA. Thanks First Minister. In terms of the use of face coverings in shops which are reopening on Monday, uh, I know you've said in the past that this might have to become mandatory. What uh, level of use uh, are you hoping to see when they reopen on Monday and how low would it need to be before you consider uh, making that rule mandatory? Um, thanks for that question, Neil, because it's, it's an important one. I'm not putting particular thresholds on any of that. I'll, I'll say a bit in a moment about the, the sort of decision making process that we'll go through um, on that issue. But we are uh, providing uh, shops and, and the real estate sector with uh, advertising uh, material so that they can promote uh, the use of face coverings in, in shops. I, I, you know, people have heard me say this before, so I won't repeat it all, but it, it does make a difference. Um, and therefore, it is really strong advice right now uh, to help with that collective effort to keep each other safe. So if you're going to a shop, please wear a face covering. Um, it doesn't have to be a medical mask. It shouldn't be a medical mask, just uh, something that you can cover your mouth and nose with. As I said, I, I wore one this morning. Um, it's not the most comfortable thing, and it takes a bit of getting used to, but I'd rather do that than take the risk of passing the virus on to somebody else or 
getting it from somebody else. Now, uh, we will be working with the retail sector over the, the next few days to try to uh, maximise uh, the, the voluntary use. Uh, but we will take a decision next week in the context of the advice that's coming from the scientific advisory group on the issue of two metre uh, and, and in what circumstances that might be uh, able to be more flexible and also the advice we've asked uh, from them on the issue of uh, settings that have a higher risk of transmission. Now, we've not asked them specifically to advise on face coverings, I, I should uh, note, but as part of what we look to do in totality to respond to whatever advice they give us, uh, we'll take a decision about whether face coverings should be uh, mandatory. And I certainly absolutely uh, do not rule that uh, out as a decision. But what I want to say to people as you start to go back to shops from Monday, uh, don't wait for it to be mandatory. Do it now because it is uh, for the protection of those around you. Uh, but if you do it uh, and therefore other people uh, are more encouraged to do it, you get protection from that. So please, please uh, see it as something we can all do to protect uh, those around us. Uh, Jason, do you want to add to that? O only that I, I agree. I, I think it's no coincidence we started facts with an, with an F. We chose an acronym that made more prominent perhaps the piece of the protection that hasn't been as prominent over the last few months. And, and that was for good reason. Most of us were at home. We, we weren't on public transport. We weren't in shops. But now things are changing. Just like we talked at the beginning about the risk of that spike, we now have to do everything we can to avoid that. Whether, that, whether that's quarantining at airports, people who are coming in, uh, importation of cases, and the personal responsibility that each of us have to, to obey the guidelines that we're setting out. So mandatory in public transport now because we're very worried as people begin to use buses and trains and trams more. And now, as we go back to a slightly more voluntary procedure, shopping, we're, we're really hopeful that people will take this very, very seriously. I don't want to see what, what I saw in Oxford Street when, when uh, London opened its shops with huge crowds with building around the front doors of shops. That, that, that made me much, much more worried than it should. And remember, you're, you're protecting shop workers as well. All of us, and I, I want to see us support our retail sector over the, the next weeks, um, responsibly, but all of us as customers, we've got a choice about whether we go to shops or not. Workers don't, they're there. So if you wear a face covering, you're helping to give them a bit of added protection too. So there's another reason uh, to do it, uh, and please uh, consider that. Uh, Paul Malik from The Courier. Good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, what is the Scottish Government's stance on private serology tests for coronavirus? Um, and is NHS Scotland being passed on the data from these tests which are being taken in pharmacies across Scotland? Uh, and with that in mind, do you encourage or discourage people from going to pharmacies and paying to take these? Um, I'll hand over to Jason, who will be able to go into this uh, from his expert uh, perspective. Can I just point out one obvious uh, issue here. Uh, we, we don't yet know antibody tests, serology tests, we don't yet know what uh, a result of those signify. So even if uh, the test is reliable, and I think Jason can talk about the current assessment of reliability of tests, we don't yet know if you show antibodies here, whether that gives you any protection, whether your immune response gives you any protection, and if it does, for how long. So there's a kind of sense of it's not telling you anything really uh, that provides you as an individual with protection. Uh, antibody tests, of course, as we're doing on a surveillance uh, basis right now, helps us to understand the virus a bit more, but be cautious about taking any assurance from the res result of one of those tests. That is absolutely right. So let's distinguish between serology, which is antibodies, the immune response, and the antigen test, which is the one you hear us talk about all the time, looking for virus and remnants of virus. So that one, we have a very clear understanding of what that one means, when it works, when it doesn't, what it means if you get a positive, and what it means if you get a negative. The serology version, we now have reliable tests, so the drug companies have managed quite remarkably and quite quickly to get as a reliable serology test globally, but we don't know what it means. So therefore, my advice is to only use it for research and surveillance. No, I have not had one. I will not be buying one. There may come a point in time when we do recommend it for much more broad use, when we know what it means. And then we will be able to say, this is how you should change your behaviour as a result of it. That may never happen, but it certainly isn't true now. So I would avoid private serology testing if I were you as an individual. I would allow us to do it for research purposes, to understand it, and to do it for surveillance purposes, to understand a little more of the virus. 
But apart from that, it, it is presently not helpful. Thanks, Jason. Um, Scott McNabb from the Scotsman. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, given the um, figures we've seen today, can I ask, when you allude to total elimination of the virus in the community, how, how far away do you think we are from uh, that stage now? And also, could the next fortnight be the, the, the most pivotal, the most critical period in Scotland's fight against the virus, given so much of um, the economy and other areas are reopening after lockdown? Well, the next fortnight is certainly important. I, I would hesitate to describe it as the most important because I might be standing here two weeks from now and saying the next fortnight is really important, as it undoubtedly will be. This is not something that we're going to you know, get rid of in a fortnight and all be able to take uh, our eye off the ball and, and drop our guard. So every week at the moment that lives in the future is a really important one in terms of keeping the virus where we, we need it to be. On elimination, um, I think it's important, and again, people like Jason help me understand these things, uh, elimination is not eradication. Eradication is when the virus is gone as a threat, and that probably, possibly only comes with a vaccine uh, that is effective. Elimination is about getting it to the lowest possible levels you can in a country, which doesn't mean it's gone away and doesn't mean it won't rise again if we stop doing the things we need to do, uh, but it gives us more confidence that we can keep it under control with surveillance and uh, testing and contact tracing and where we see outbreaks with very targeted measures as opposed to blanket lockdowns. Now, how far away are we from that? I think we are not that far away from that. Uh, the challenge is keeping it there, and that's what's difficult, and that takes... All of us doing all the things that we are advising you to do, but it also means we have to be very vigilant around people coming into Scotland from other, other parts of the world or, or even other parts of the UK where infection rates might be higher. Um, and it, it means that all of us have to be very aware of the importance of if we have symptoms getting tested. So it, we're in, a, you know, in that sense, we're in an increasingly strong position in Scotland, but it's not a position that should give rise to one iota of complacency because getting it to that level doesn't stop it rising again. We all have to stop it rising again, and I can't stress that enough. Do you want to say more? Maybe tu tuberculosis is a good comparison. So tuberculosis is pretty much eliminated from the general population in Scotland. We get outbreaks in particularly vulnerable communities, but we don't go around every day with a risk of tuberculosis for us. It is eliminated from general circulation. But around the world, tuberculosis is nowhere near eradicated. It happens in refugee camps, it happens in poorer countries, and kills thousands and thousands a year. So, so that's the difference between the two. Smallpox, eradicated. No, no risk of smallpox anywhere in the world presently. And that required a vaccine on a global scale. So it's important to draw the distinction. We should, of course, aim for the lowest number we can possibly get to reduce the risk to our overall population. That would be effective elimination of this virus from Scotland's general population. Even then, I still think, and most of the scientists think, we would still see localised outbreaks in particular areas, and we would have to manage them using test and protect, using local measures inside whatever that institution or region was. And the country that's often talked about in terms of having eliminated it is New Zealand. Um, and New Zealand has appears to have pretty much eliminated it from its domestic population. But New Zealand's border controls right now are very, very, very stringent. Unless you're a New Zealander, um, you don't, generally speaking, uh, have the ability to enter New Zealand. And anybody who does has to go into strict quarantine. So elimination doesn't mean the risk has gone away. It means we get it to a level where we, th we think we can better manage it with the right interventions. But some of those interventions include all of us following the advice that we have been giving and talking about a lot. Daniel Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Larry Flanagan has said there cannot be a social distancing rule for outside of schools and a different one for inside classrooms. Um, so I was just hoping you could clarify when you talk about schools returning full time in August without the need for physical distancing, does that mean there would be no need for um, any social distancing anywhere in Scotland? Or are you talking about having separate rules for schools and separate rules in the community? Um, and also, can I just ask Professor Leach whether you were consulted about um, the change in education policy ahead of uh, John Swinney's statement on Tuesday? 
And also, how likely do you think it is that schools will be able to open safely without physical distancing in August? Thank you. OK, um, I covered this at length yesterday, so I'm not going to repeat everything I said then. I'll, I'll make the observation again that last week, of course, I was you know, being asked questions almost every day at this briefing about why we weren't bringing children back full time. This week it's been, why are we bringing seeking to bring children back full time. We're trying to do the best for children and we're trying to do it safely. And I think that is what everybody should expect from, from a government. The issues about how we do that safely, uh, we, we think we've got the virus to a level now that we can plan for full time return in August. That wasn't the case a few weeks ago when the levels of infection were higher, which is why we developed the blended learning contingency, which we may still need. So it's important to have it there, but we are planning now for a full time return. But the work over the summer that requires to be done, not just on uh, making sure we get to an agreed position around physical distancing, but on the testing that will be required, the other hygiene measures, that's the work we need to do uh, to make sure that young people, parents, teachers have confidence in that. And that will be uh, work that is overseen by the education recovery uh, group over uh, the period ahead. And of course, all of it is predicated on us continuing to suppress the virus. And if all of us, you know, if, if we need an added incentive to continue to do all the right things, then the prospect of being able to get children back to full-time ed education should certainly be that added incentive for all of us. Uh, yes, I was consulted. The principal advisor to the Education Recovery Group is one of our deputy CMOs because we have to divide the work up a little. But yes, I was uh, involved. I've spoken to Mr Swinney a number of times through this pandemic, including more recently about this particular move and with the Cabinet and the First Minister about what that advice would be. Advice, advice works in a kind of pyramid. So there's general conversations and then as it gets more specific, then the Education Recovery Group receives that and makes decisions about what advice it will eventually give to the Deputy First Minister. And I was involved in that process. I'm also married to a secondary school teacher, so you can be absolutely certain that that advice has been discussed in my house on a number of occasions about what's safe and what isn't. I am comfortable with the trajectory heading towards the 11th of August, but I'm also cautious about the trajectory. I, I think it will only be possible if we continue to see the numbers go in the direction they're going. If the First Minister's back here in four weeks, five weeks' time with me, and we are saying that we've gone in the wrong direction, exactly for the second spike reasons we've just described, then, then I, I think the contingency plan is needed. But, but I, I really hope with all my heart that that isn't required, because uh, for friends and family of mine who talk to me about their children and the challenges with homeschooling, the challenges with blended learning, I really hope we can get them back. And I think it's possible. Alice Grant from Herald. Uh, hi there, thanks very much. Just to go back to the, the scenes in parks in recent days, uh, could you potentially consider closing parks or beaches if people continue to gather in large groups? Uh, and also alcohol has obviously played, uh, played a part in these scenes. Could there potentially be a crackdown on outdoor drinking? Look, you will have heard me say uh, right throughout this crisis that I, I, I won't stand here and rule out anything that I, I judge and the government judges and on things like this that would be with the, the advice of the police. I won't rule out anything that we are advised may be required to stop the spread of this virus because, you know, we, we've seen the damage the virus can do. But we're not planning these things um, at, at the moment uh, because we hope, as has been the case for the last three months and more, that people will continue to do the right thing. So I, I appeal to people. I know, I know I, you've heard me say this day in and day out now for months. I do know how difficult this is. Um, I've, I've got you know, young members of my own family. I hear it f from them. I, and I feel particularly for young people. You know, the summer, you know, when you're my age, uh, hitting, uh, hitting 50 sooner than I, I care to, to contemplate, you know, one summer is one summer. When you're 18, you don't get your summer as an 18-year-old back again. So I, I feel to my core heart sorry for young people right now. But this is necessary stuff. You, we have to follow these rules to stop us going backwards uh, because we all know the consequences of that. So, yes, we will keep everything as an option if it is necessary. But if we all voluntarily follow these rules, these kind of things won't be necessary. So that's my appeal to, to everybody across the country. Uh, Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thanks, First Minister. On a point related to that, Police Scotland has put out a press notice today about mass gatherings over the weekend, protests planned over the weekend, and we've seen all under one banner talking about 
holding a series of pro-independence marches starting on the 20th of July in Edinburgh. What impact would these kind of gatherings have on efforts to keep the virus uh, suppressed? Well, they will potentially jeopardise the efforts to keep the virus suppressed. Uh, as things stand right now, these kind of mass gatherings uh, are not advised. In fact, we strongly advise against them and, and there are legal enforcement powers, uh, as I said in, in my uh, opening remarks. So my advice to ev anybody, whether it's all under one banner or anybody else protesting for any other reason or people wanting to gather in the sunshine in Kelvin Grove Park, please don't do it because you are putting our progress at risk. And if our progress starts to go backwards, lives are at risk. I understand, I'm, you know, I've been a political activist since I was 16 years old. I'm, I'm a politician. Um, I know how important protest is. I know how important uh, democratic expression is, not just at elections, but through marches and gatherings. I've taken part in more of these over my life than I can count. Uh, but right now, they are risky. So find other ways to make your views known. I'm not asking people uh, not to make their views known. Of course I'm not. But do it in other ways. Do it in safe ways. Because if we jeopardise this progress, we'll all be under these restrictions for a lot longer. Our economy will be under pressure for a lot longer. And more people will die. We've come so far over the past difficult, painful three months. Let's not go back. So a bit more sacrifice for a bit longer gets us through this immediate threat of this, the risk of a spike that we spoke about and allows us that time to plan properly as we need to do over the next few months for what might be a second wave in the winter, which is much less difficult to predict. And of course, as Jason said, much more uh, difficult to be certain about. So please, please, please don't do things that you know are giving this virus the chance to spread again. Michael Blackley from the Mail. Thank you, First Minister. You mentioned earlier on that retailers have done an enormous amount of work to prepare for reopening on Monday. And part of that work has obviously been preparing for two metre social distancing. Um, would, would it not have made sense to uh, conclude the review in time for that reopening? And if it's the case that a few days after opening their doors with all the, the signage in place and such like for two metres, uh, and then you, you change that, uh, will you provide compensation for retailers? Well, I know the Daily Mail often thinks I should just follow uh, the UK government. Um, but interestingly, I, I don't think I should blindly follow anybody. I think I should make the decisions that I think are right for Scotland. That's my job and my duty. Uh, but, you know, retail opened in England before uh, the decision taken this week by the UK government to give flexibility, not abandon the two metre, because that's not what they've done in England, but give more flexibility. Um, I've got to take these decisions on the basis of the best advice and the best evidence. Uh, moving away from two metres is not consequential free, it's not risk free, it increases the risk. So I've got to go through with my advisors and, and the rest of the government a process of assuring ourselves that we understand that risk and we can mitigate it. Um, I understand, I, I understand and I hear loudly and clearly the economic arguments for uh, more flexibility around two metres and I, I hope we can get there. But I've got to do that carefully so that we're not putting lives at risk because lives really matter too. And if this virus starts to go out of control again, that doesn't help the economy. So I, I will continue to take these decisions in a, a careful and cautious way. And, you know, I heard somebody say yesterday, somebody in the media, I can't remember who it was, and I wouldn't name them even if I could, say Scotland's lagging behind the rest of the UK in opening up the economy. Well, that's not strictly true. We're perhaps a couple of weeks behind England. But flip that the other way round right now. England is lagging behind Scotland in the suppression of this virus. Our case numbers are falling faster and they're at a lower level. The numbers of people dying are now at a lower level proportionately than in England. So what that says to me is the, the, the approach we are pursuing is working. So let's stick at it and build that sustainable and lasting recovery for our economy that we need. And that means when we're changing any of the advice around this, we've got to do so carefully. And I think that is in the, the long-term interest of the economy, as well as in the long-term interest of the health of the country. Uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. Um, it was just following on from Dan's question on schools. Um, We've been contacted by teachers with concerns about the return to full-time schooling. And one of the issues that they've raised um, is the possibility that they'll be asked to mix with pupils with no social distancing in place, 
but still won't be able to go near or hug family members from other households uh, because they'll be following social distancing in that regard. Um, is that likely to be the case? And if so, do you think that's fair? Um, what I think is fair is that we do everything we can to stop people getting a virus that can kill them and, and do long-term health damage. So that, that's the fairness that I think we have to continue to apply. Um, we don't, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't tell you exactly what all the rules are going to be on August the 11th. Um, but what I do know is if we continue with the progress we're making right now, then not just will we be able to get schools back full time, we may be able to relax some of the other uh, rules that are in place, although all the basic hygiene measures will continue to be really important. But this is all predicated on us all continuing to do the right thing. And if we do that, then we will all get back to greater normality and perhaps more quickly than we might have envisaged before and hopefully a lot more sustainably as well. Vivian Aitken from the Daily Record. Question, First Minister. Um, with the shops about to reopen on Monday, um, there must be a, an element of caution and, and fear that we're going to have the same situation as we had on Oxford Street that Jason Leach touched on earlier. I would hope that Scots would show a bit more restraint, but have you ahead of the opening had a discussion with the Chief Constable to see if we're going to get more police on the streets for the first few days that the rules are relaxed? Well, I, I have had and continue to have regular discussions with the Chief Constable throughout uh, this pandemic. He stood uh, on a few occasions next to me at, at these briefings. The, the police have done, under the, the leadership and the stewardship of the Chief Constable, I think Police Scotland have done an excellent job in uh, enforcing the regulations and managing the risky situations here proportionately and, and sensitively. And I've been a big, had a big part to play in the progress that we've made. And I have every confidence that the police will continue uh, to take that approach. So I, I, I trust that the, the judgment of the, the Chief Constable and, of course, operationally, the, the Chief Constable is, is his own uh, master in, in making these decisions. Um, what I would say, though, uh, and repeat what Jason said earlier on, we all have a part to play here. Um, we all want to get back to normal for some of us who like shopping that will include going back to the shops and we we want i desperately want us to support our retail sector um, and our high streets and, and help them to get back to normal but we must do it responsibly and, and carefully and cautiously by following the advice so you know if, if everybody follows if, if you take the new look store that i was at this morning if everybody on the way into a store like that follows the, the guidance that is very clearly marked for people, if everybody behaves in the way that the shop will be advising you to behave, if you don't, if, if you turn up to a shopping uh, area, a high street or a shop, and there's a crowd that's not properly socially distancing, then come away, don't go there. And if everybody behaves like that, then we won't have these scenes. Uh, but where issues like that arise, I have confidence that the police will deal with them appropriately, uh, sensitively and proportionately. Tom Martin from the Daily Express. Thank you, First Minister, and good afternoon. Um, just on the issue again of shops and face coverings, um, you mentioned obviously a decision being made next week. Um, how quickly would that be implemented? And if mandatory, uh, would it be you know backed up by fines like it has been um, on transport? And secondly, do you think shops should be able to refuse or turn away people who aren't currently wearing masks, given sort of an importance being attached attached to this? Well, it, it's not mandatory at the moment. It is strongly advised, and, and therefore, you know, that's a, an important distinction in, in terms of shops uh, turning people away. Um, in terms of your, your question, it, it would, you know, and if we take this decision, we'll set out, out all the detail of it, but it would be likely to follow the same enforcement model as uh, for public transport. Um, and in terms of the speed, I think uh, you'll, you'll correct me if you check and find that I'm getting that my memories wrong here, but I think we announced on public transport on a Thursday and it came into force the following Monday. We, we have to lay regulations to make it mandatory, but it can be done as we uh, showed on public transport pretty quickly. But we'll I'll uh, set out our decision on that uh, later this week. If our decision is to make it mandatory, that will happen quickly. If our decision is not to make it mandatory this week, uh, that doesn't mean we, we will never review that decision. We would, we would always keep it under review. Uh, but please do it anyway and wear uh, face coverings when you go to shops. Uh, lastly today, Derek Keeley from the PNG. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I wanted to ask you about crowds at beaches and parks. I know you've address the wider issue on that. Um, business owners in the north and northeast have already seen a surge in bookings for staycation and holiday accommodation. Given the scenes we've seen this week, are you concerned at all about the potential for large numbers of people to soon be visiting beaches and parks and possibly quite remote areas? And is there any specific advice available to help business owners mitigate that risk? Um, so 
to, to general points, I'm a, Fiona might want to say a bit more about advice to business owners because, yes, we, we do want to work with sectors and businesses to, he, to equip them to deal with any issues uh, effectively. Um, often these questions, uh, understandably, are, are prefaced with the, the sort of uh, are you concerned, do you have a concern? I think you can take it as read that in the, given the, the nature of what we're dealing with right now, I have a concern about all of this. I Every time I remember when we went into phase one t standing here and telling you that I felt very anxious about that, I still feel anxious about all of these changes because I know how easy it would be for us to start going backwards again. Um, so yes, I, I have an anxiety and a concern about all of these things, but equally, and this is what makes me more positive, I know that if we all do the right things, we can mitigate those concerns and we can reduce the risks. And what I would say is, a bit like shops, I want people to support the tourist industry over the summer in particular. They've had, had a dreadful time and it's going to continue to be hard uh, for the tourist sector. So if you are able to in Scotland, if you, you have the wherewithal and the time to do it, please plan a staycation, go and support our uh, local tourist uh, industry, but do so safely. It is not the case that you can't have a staycation without going to crowded places. You can go and stay somewhere in one of the many, many, many beautiful parts of our country, but still stay away from crowded places and still apply all of the, the very sensible guidance that, that we're giving. So this is, and this is more so now than it has been at any stage of this crisis. It is now much more down to our individual judgments and responsibility. And I come back to this central point. Every decision we take right now has an impact on other people. So let's all be responsible and we will continue collectively to keep this virus under control. Fiona. We want people to support their country and we want people to book their holidays in Scotland, but we want them to do so knowing that where they go will be safe and we want people to behave in a safe way when they get there. Uh, we've talked previously about workplace guidance. We've referred to it in terms of um, the retail sector. The tourism guidance for workplaces and tourism was uh, published last week. Fergus Ewing, the Tourism Secretary, has also uh, announced a system that will give assurance and a, demonstrate where businesses have complied and made sure and done their assessments to make sure that they are safe. So people need to have confidence to go to safe places. We want people to go there and enjoy themselves, spend money in Scotland to help the tourist economy. But it takes responsibility on both sides, both by the business owners, and we know that those guidance documents can help them in preparing, but also we want those that are visiting to be respectful of the places that they're visiting but also to enjoy them. So I think if we try and do this together um, in a respectful way, uh, in a way that is safe, uh, we can not only make sure that we're supporting the tourism economy, we can make sure that people who really deserve a break, many, many people need a break and a holiday, uh, that they can get what they want. But importantly, we can give a real boost to our tourism sector and our hotels uh, and other parts of that uh, industry that really need our support. And it's time that we do that. OK, thanks, Fiona. Um, that concludes the questions today. Thank you to uh, all of the journalists. My thanks to... Fiona and Jason and to Robert, our BSL interpreter uh, today. Um, can I thank all of you for joining us and just end uh, by wishing you a good weekend uh, or as good as it can be in the circumstances we live in, but reminding you of facts. Uh, face coverings in enclosed spaces, avoid crowded places. Please avoid crowded uh, places. Clean your hands and clean hard surfaces uh, when you touch them. Two metres distance, that remains the advice and remains uh, very important and self-isolate if you have symptoms of COVID and immediately book a test. These are increasingly the five key things that all of us can do to keep this virus under control and make sure that the kind of uh, reports I've been able to give you today of numbers of cases and deaths continuing to fall carries on. So my thanks to all of you for your cooperation um, and collective sacrifice and let's keep doing the right thing and keep this virus firmly in retreat. Thank you all very much indeed. I will see you back here on Monday. Uh, we no longer do a weekend briefing, so I'll see you back here on Monday at 12.30.